the poet Padraiga Tuma. The tree of knowledge. Having eaten only one fruit from it, we cut the tree of knowledge down. We broke its boughs, ripped it from the land it fed and fed from. Some man made branches with machines. Some woman cut new leaves from steel. The tree sent up its sighs, lamenting that the land it held together could no longer now be held together. From the tree's remains we made paper, but words kept on appearing on the pages with warnings that we didn't want to read. We burned it, dumped it, waited. We wanted something else to save us. My name's Dr Gail Bradbrook. I'm one of the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion. I first experienced a sense of utter dread and panic around what we're doing to the environment as a really young woman. I guess I was nine, actually, and a factory was being built on some land and I didn't have any say in it and I felt really aggrieved. And it's been there over the years, but I remember it really strongly in 2013 when I looked at images of tar sands. But mostly it's just been this feeling of hidden, a hidden buried feeling that nothing's really happening here and we're just letting this thing run and run. And then last summer, I started to really grieve and panic and recognise that I hadn't fully faced the meaning of these times and it's quite an unravelling when you do. I definitely have had those feelings before, but there was some weight of it that came in in the summer. I I, I think there's something in the consciousness that's shifting personally, and, you know, it's an opening up that happens when you grieve, because the price of um, love is grief, and grief opens the space for love, and I think that's what's happening right now, is we're facing what we've been doing to our home, And our home is heaven on earth. And I look around now with my heart more open, feeling more courageous. And I look at nature and I'm in love. I feel hopelessly in love with life at times. And I think that's the gift of grief. The climate scientist, Professor Kevin Anderson. This is due to the barrier reef that people people know about, they've heard about. That at 1.5 degrees centigrade, the estimates are that we, we probably will have destroyed something like three quarters of the barrier reef. But if you go to 2 degrees centigrade, you pretty much wipe out that whole ecosystem. So we're, t- we're not t- at 1.5, it's not as if this is, this is a good position to be in. It's probably the least worst position we can be in. And across a whole suite of really important emblematic ecosystems, we see high levels of destruction at 1.5 but most of them have elements of these are still surviving as you head towards two degrees centigrade then the the level of destruction of these ecosystems becomes more severe to levels where sometimes some of them will not simply will simply not recover and so whether it's in in terms of sort of um, rainforest cover whether it's in terms of things like the the coral reefs and so forth but then in terms of your pest movements and agriculture but in terms of human systems of the exposure to additional droughts and heat waves um, or severe weather conditions, increased sea level rise as that plays out in the longer term. Almost all of the things that we think about in terms of climate change get noticeably worse between 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade. Now clearly 2 degrees centigrade is better than 2.5 and 2.5 is better than 3. But I think what was important in that report was saying that here's a set of impacts that look pretty bad at 1.5 and here's a set of impacts at 2 degrees centigrade and they're noticeably worse. I cannot envisage how we can now hold to a 1.5 degree centigrade of warming. I cannot imagine scenarios that would deliver uh, such rapid cuts in emissions. 
But I think there's still a reasonable to outside chance we can hold below 2 degrees centigrade of warming. I hope to be wrong. I, I really would like to be wrong on the 1.5. I hope other people can come up and say, well, here's, here are ways that we can do this. It's the area I work on, and I can't understand how you would make those sorts of changes rapidly enough. The only way that I can em envisage it is that if we make all the reductions that are necessary for 2 degrees centigrade by actually cutting back on our emissions, that's primarily through three phases. One is consuming less energy in the very near term. In the medium term, to dramatically improve our use and efficiency of that energy. And the third part is to switch our energy across to zero carbon options, very rapidly indeed. If we do all of those things in line with 2 degrees centigrade, and this technology that a lot of people talk about now called negative emission technologies. These don't exist. These are in a few pilot schemes, but mostly in the imagination of professors and academics and on computers and so forth. If those can be made to work and we do everything possible for two degrees centigrade on the outside chance, then we might, if we're lucky, we might hold the 1.5. I think it's incredibly dangerous. But we're now relying on those technologies that don't exist not only for 1.5, but also for 2 degrees centigrade. Indeed, if you look at some of the scenarios developed for the IPCC, even some of the scenarios for 3 degrees centigrade also assume lots of negative emission technologies. The benefit of those, at least the short-term political benefit of those, is that it means we haven't got to reduce our emissions as rapidly as we otherwise would do. So if you come to a country like the UK, you've got our Committee on Climate Change, who are sort of a semi-independent um, arm of government in many respects. And their latest report, which a lot of people held, has been wonderful. Um, basically, it's just r ramped up, increased still further their original assumption about negative emission technologies. So they can say things like, yes, you can expand aviation in the UK. It's probably OK to have some shale gas and some further um, offshore oil and gas exploration if we're careful about this. Um, all of this is still possible within our Paris commitments. But the caveat to that is if our children can, can develop and deploy at huge scale these negative emission technologies. don't know exactly how things will play out I mean things are not looking positive when we're rapidly changing um, sort of ecosystems and social systems then there are going to be lots of problems and issues and challenges and lots of pain and suffering that will emerge from these rapid changes so we're seeing pest movements changes in rainfall changes in heat waves changes in migratory patterns of species and of people as people will will certainly some parts of the, of the world will be moving to find more appropriate you know, um, areas that are climatically more suitable to live in and often these will play out um, against other existing tensions. Some people have argued that climate change was one of the exacerbating factors and let's be clear it exacerbated factors it wasn't causing what happened in Syria. So you know, they had had a very long drought um, which had some implications on stressing certain communities but then obviously on top of that and what much more important than that were all the other stresses that occurred there but this is with just one degree centigrade of warming, what we're already starting to witness is climate change exacerbating existing problems elsewhere in the world. Um, and in Darfur, we saw changes in rainfall patterns that looked like they were linked to ongoing climate change. And that created, because of the way the pasture lands were used and because of the migration of some of the tribes and so forth and cultures within those communities that occur every year, that people weren't moving on as fast as they had done previously. So the next group were coming in and you got you've got fighting again there and lots of deaths as a consequence. So climate change plays out in, in ways that it, it builds on other tensions, at least at the moment. I think as we get increased levels of warming, what we're going to start to see is that climate change is sometimes the actual direct, the principal cause for some of these, for some of these um, social frictions that we see around the world. You can also see in things like Haiyan, which was a you know, devastating um, typhoon in the Philippines a few years ago, or indeed in Mozambique more recently, or more, you know, more well covered in the media, things like Sandy uh, in New York, the storm event there, that we've already seen about 20 centimetres of sea level rise as a consequence of the additional warming from burning fossil fuels. 
and we are going to go we are going to see ongoing increases in sea level and they could be very significant i mean a meter across this century is an unreasonable estimate some people estimate it could be quite a lot higher than that but what we will be seeing is a lot more um, across the following century or two because we are locking in we are setting in train now ongoing melting in greenland and parts of antarctic once we've started that it's hard to imagine how you could possibly reverse it and there are some very worrying signs that we're starting to see this happening a little bit earlier than we had expected. And this, this means then once we've started that, once we trigger that, then we will be seeing changes to the, to, the, to the land masses, significant changes to the land masses across the globe. And you think that most cities, most people live um, around the coastal zones. You start to see a whole suite of really you know, major implications for these parts of the world. My name is Damaris Albuquerque. I come from Nicaragua, country in Central America, and I'm currently directing CEPAL, which is the, stands for the Council of Protestant Churches in Nicaragua. And Nicaragua is an agricultural country, and also our farmers, they do basic agriculture, not uh, technolo technological. So they rely on the climate for growing the crops. If it's dry, if it's re too rainy, then it affects them. And uh, our rainy season usually runs from May to November. And that has been how they have farmed in the, in the past. But recent years, that has changed. And so we don't know when the rainy season will start or when will it end. And, and it is more, has been more dry in the recent years and also bring some flood, flooding at the end because we are close to the Caribbean. We get all the hurricanes uh, in the month of October and those uh, hurricanes come now stronger, you know, with more uh, harder rains and that, of course, uh, affects uh, the way they grow things and we are always suffering from droughts or floods we, we work with uh, communities, villages, and uh, one of the, the one of the program is to directed to farmers, to agriculture, how they can um, farm uh, in these conditions, and uh, we teach them techniques on how to make better use of their ground, how to conserve the water, soil conservation, how to use resistant seeds. Uh, to the climate, uh, native seeds, and how to grow other crops that are more resistant and also there are more short-term crops so they can have food all year round. And also it's affecting water because now the rivers are drying out and are contaminated as well. And for example, in Teustepe, which is an area which is in the, uh, the dry corridor, we call it a dry corridor. And uh, they have a river that goes dry during the dry season and then gets its water during the flooding season. But the water is diverted be for the, uh, by the rice growers. So they have, the rice growers have enough water for their rice crops, but then the people uh, are left without water. Uh, all of us should have equal rights to the to the natural resources, to the creation, and so the, then the, those who have more take advantage of the resources and le leave the others without them. We are hopeful for the present, but in the long run, we also are affected by those phenomena, El Niño y La Niña, I don't know if you're aware of them, El Niño brings dry season, no rain. And La Niña is all the, all the contrary, a lot of rain. And uh, so we are afraid that, that, that there will be no water, enough water. We work with farmers, uh, helping them to, to make what we call micro dams. There is a hole in the ground, you put plastic to capture water. But if the pattern continues as it is now, there will be no water to capture 
Also, we work with them with uh, water filters because the water that is available is contaminated. I think it will not be too sustainable in the long future if we don't make any changes to protect our, uh, our environment. My name is Rachel and I work for Hope for the Future. So I had some vegetarian friends at church at university and I was very confused as to why on earth they were vegetarian and why they kept saying that that was part of their faith. I really didn't understand. Um, and so it was sort of through my friendship through their, them that I kind of asked questions and was kind of wondering what was happening with that. And then um, a group of students um, that I knew were also involved in the divestment movement also at um, university. I was like, oh, interesting. I will start getting a little bit involved in that. Um, I studied philosophy and part of my political philosophy paper was a little section on climate change, which I found so utterly distressing. <laughs> and I mean that in a sense of like the philosophical arguments for why it doesn't matter that climate change gets worse because the identity of future persons isn't fixed. And I was alarmed that you could just think that that was a reason not to act. Um, and sort of, I guess, once you start having something on your radar, you start noticing it in the other parts of your life. And so I started on a very slippery, slippery slope um, into the environmental movement, which became more and more entrenched. And after I graduated and moved to London, that was just at the time that XR was starting. And so I was at that point compelled enough that I became involved in that. And then through that, lots of other activism movements. And now I work in the sector. Yeah, so I started with sort of the more personal things, and that was at university. So I... Um, was vegan for Lent in my second year of university and um, most, mostly it was just like well I want to be able to say that I've tried it and then at the end during Holy Week I was like I will reflect on this and then that was when I started making the links between faith and the environmental movement and I was very convicted by it and um, so that was the beginning and then the following year I kind of made that decision that I wouldn't fly on a plane ever again um, which was a big choice but one that I felt I needed to make and sat right with me um, and that still kind of held through. Deciding not to fly, for example, was a huge thing for me because it effectively meant shutting down quite a lot of the world. So previously, if someone was talking about Australia or um, Indonesia or their trips to those places, there was a sense that that could be me at some point, but um, now there very much isn't. But interestingly, I was like, actually, the vast majority of people on the planet don't ever get to make that choice, and I had the privilege to be able to make that choice. I think there's something really um, interesting about kind of a biblical parallel between um, you find your life when you lose it and actually when you um, make choices that are costly, you also gain in a richness of something else that I don't really know how to put into words. But that has definitely been true in my own life and the things that I've decided in this area is that I've it now no longer feels like a sacrifice at all. It just feels like I found new sources of life in being able to make those decisions. We're in the sixth mass extinction event. That's clear from the science. It's named in the science. And scientists use words like biological annihilation on their papers. You know, it's it's... There have been five other extinction events. People know about the dinosaurs. And we're looking at I think around a million species potentially going extinct and if they don't get extinct they're going to be near obliterated you know a one in five mammals in this country may be gone within a decade in the UK UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world and that's one of the things that breaks my heart and also lifts my heart you know I was on an organic farm recently a small one and there were swarms of insects like they used to be in my childhood and when I go to places where there are packs of sparrows, it always seems to be the sparrows that get me. I always think they're like little working class birds, aren't they? They're like in packs and a bit ordinary looking and gorgeous. So the yeah, it's important that we are real. And I think what we stumbled across, Roger's original paper that he put together was called Tell the Truth and ask people to act accordingly. And it was like, let's stop doing this thing that the Green Movement's doing, which is pussyfooting around reality. 
Let's say it as it is. Uh, let's tell the science as it is and including the precautionary principle. So I don't know if you know, but the 2050 target that government seems to have adopted, which is an, a, a nightmare, it has only a 50% chance of succeeding. So they've given themselves a target, and we know they miss targets, and with only a 50% chance of succeeding, of keeping the temperatures in, in any kind of safe domain. But this is not... I mean, if you don't get the waiting list right on the NHS, people will suffer and some people will die, and that's appalling. And what we're talking about here is the potential extinction of, of, of the human race and a mass extinction of plant and animal species. You have to use strong words when, you, when you're dealing with things like that. And the other word, rebellion, you know, it's a very British thing in some ways, rebellion. It's, it's not something we do easily, but we do have a history of rising up. And as we say, we're not in protest, we're in a space where the social contract is broken. You know, it's whether wherever you are on the political spectrum, you might be more centrist or a bit more on the right. There are political commentators like Hobbes or Locke who talk about the right to rebel and the actually the duty to rebel. So the Declaration of Rebellion, if people read that online, I think it's a beautiful piece of prose. It was written by Simon Bramwell, who's one of the uh, first people who were part of Extinction Rebellion and Rising Up. And um, it has that depth of Britishness in it, I think, of the idea of duty and things being sacred and how we love this land, you know, the, the idea that you love your land and you love your country seems to have been again adopted by the right. Whereas I think, you know, I love, I absolutely fucking love this country. It's gorgeous. And I love the people. I love our humour. I love how we play with irony. I, I love that cringing feeling of embarrassment we have around each other that's just ridiculous that none of us seem to be able to get over, you know. I mean, we're, we're, we're wonderful and we f*** the world over. It's down to us to really undo what we've done and to melt our hearts. So I was talking about tell the truth and ask people to act accordingly and the green movement needing to change how it does things and we stumbled across this. Well, it was Roger's idea and it was a good idea, but it had a piece missing. When you look at Jane Morton's work, who's a psychologist, she talks about emergency mode messaging and how the green movement needs to move into that. So it was very much backing up our, this idea uh, that you, you tell people the truth and in an emergency, a new bit of people emerge. You know, an opportunity is there within an emergency. It's not all bad. And people are willing to act according to their values, which is to, to, to everything else gets set aside in an emergency, doesn't it? And you do what's necessary. And the other piece that needs to be in there is the idea of a vision that it's possible to do. It's possibly going to work. So if your house is on fire, you are going to break in because it's possible you're going to save your children in, in the bedroom or whatever. You're not going to worry about, you're not going to sit there and calculate the percentage likelihood. Are you just going to go and do it because that's the right thing to do? And uh, maybe you'll succeed. And, and of course, you're going to try. And I think for me, there is a need now to hold this vision for each other that we have woken up to what we've done because it's a mess. And how, you know, as Greta said it, how dare we? But also we were broken and traumatised. That's why we did it. We didn't realise. Now we're waking up to it and falling back in love with each other in life. And it's time to clean up after ourselves and I think that's a, such an honourable way to spend our lives I've been trying to start mass civil disobedience for a while and through praying I met Roger Hallam and we started organising together and pulling meetings together and groups and other people joined us and a, a momentum developed and we tried out various tactics and so it was this group called Rising Up that we named it in the end and we would gather every few months at people's houses so you're sitting in my sitting room and this is where we made the decision to do Extinction Rebellion and then we gathered in a cafe in Bristol a few weeks later to start planning it so we'd have like um, I was just thinking about this room just behind there Ian Bray who's a Quaker that's where he would sleep somebody down the corridor there we thought like 20 to 30 people crashed out in this little three bed house um, and it, it feels incredible like I actually often don't believe it's actually happening that we're now in 63 countries there's 
We have a, a reach on social media of a million people and uh, it's growing all the time. There's there's over 200 groups in the UK and it, it's it's heading so far so good, you know, in the right direction in terms of numbers. It needs to have about 2 million people in the UK that are actively supporting a rebellion. I am a freelance academic. I have an honorary position at Glasgow University. Um, I am an activist. Many, my work is best known for land reform and various environmental campaigns, uh, also urban poverty and matters to do with human ecology as well as natural ecology. Alistair McIntosh, calling in from Glasgow during lockdown. Issues of climate change and how we appraise the science of climate change have been very much on my mind. And uh, you know, I've used the lockdown usefully to complete that work. I'm noticing a uh, much greater propensity to anger, to flashpoint type stuff. And I think it's a combination of the actual effects of being in lockdown and you know, folk starting to go a bit, get, get a bit rattled by it. And the whole constellation of circumstances of our time, of which the virus obviously is one element, but by no means the only element, and in the longer term, a relatively small element compared with climate change. Pandemics go right back in our history. You know, the earliest annals, whether from China or the annals of the Celtic monks and so on, talk of repeated great plagues coming upon the world. Archaeologists will tell you that when you find a deserted medieval village or signs thereof, usually it's been a plague that has been behind the cause of it being deserted. Trends in human behaviour very much increase the likelihood of pandemics. The World Health Organization since 1990s has had on its pandemic section of its website a warning that pandemics are likely to happen in the future. It's not a question of if, but when, and that when they do come, they could kill millions. The Spanish flu of 1918, 1919, uh, killed between 20 and 40 million. The coronavirus, as of yesterday, had killed 400,000 people worldwide. And this is in a world where we have far more advanced medical support facilities than we had back then at the time of the ending of the First World War. So yes, pandemics are likely to keep on coming, to keep on hitting us. And in the case of the coronavirus, I think we can see very clearly how modern living and particularly fossil fuel driven living are key drivers in what is happening because fossil fuels have enabled us to live with very intense population density. So when you've got a lot of people close together, you've got a considerable pool for infections to spread, combined with the fact that that mandates things like factory farming and the intensive factory farming of animals could well be a factor in this coronavirus. And then the third factor is that fossil fuels enable rapid transportation around the world. So, you know, it's thought that the reason there was so much of it in northern Italy was that they had close trading links with Wuhan province. So the virus was maybe brought back there and got a foothold early on. That's only made possible because we can jump on a plane and be across the world tomorrow, carrying the virus with us in ways that in the past would be a very much slower process. And what the IPCC report on climate change in the land says, the one that came out last year, is that it says that it's a combination of changing land use, partly driven by climate change, that can cause human beings to encroach into wildlife areas. Basically, you know, if you're a bit short on food, then you go poaching for wild animals or what have you. And when you bring those back into the human food chain, there is a higher risk 
of epidemics and possibly pandemics breaking out. So a threat multiplier is something which you can't directly lay a finger on, but it is likely to increase other forms of threat, whether threats of agricultural failure, threats of conflict, or threats of pandemics breaking out. I think that the you know, the pause, as I heard a friend of mine call it the other day, the way in which we've all had to go on slow, uh, we've been laid off our work and all the rest of it. The pause has led to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. At the peak of it in China, I saw one statistic that said that the CO2 emissions had reduced by 25%. But, you know, still churning out 75%. Most of the factories kept going. Most of the agriculture kept going and so on. Um, aviation, although we, f we focus on it a lot, is responsible for only something like 2% of emissions. So simply stopping the planes in itself has not led to a dramatic drop in CO2 emissions. So the CO2 is still building up. And the concern that I have, that, you know, what are we seeing? But as soon as it starts biting, you get President Trump in America saying that he's going to relax environmental regulations on corporations to make it easier for them to compete again. You have the Chinese advertising cars to try and get the car economy going. And here in Britain, Boris Johnson doing the same thing with reopening not just garden centers first, but also car sales rooms first. So my concern is that we've seen a little bit of what can be done, but there is huge counterpoint pressure to bring back consumerism as usual with all the emissions that that will entail. The theologian Hannah Malcolm calling in from lockdown. I guess it's three months now for us, my husband and I have been in lockdown in uh, Mossside in Manchester where we live um, and my husband um, is more vulnerable so um, we have to um, abide by stricter social distancing rules um, and I think one of the um, one of the real challenges that it's brought home for me as someone who um, have to manage my own um, chronic mental health condition um, and who also relies quite heavily on um, being outside being amongst other creatures um, in order to manage my well-being um, has been um, a reminder of just how uneven um, access to other creatures, access to the living world is um, for people in our country losses of green space, losses of other creatures. Um, the loss of the living world has been much more keenly felt in lower income neighborhoods and communities. Um, and something like how much um, local park, how much green space per person in a neighborhood is a really telling um, measure of the uneven ways that we treat each other. Historically, we've made this theological distinction between um, natural evil and moral evil, which has been our way of dealing with um, the fact that um, some kinds of bad things that happen in the world, we can say, well, that was the direct um, result of human sinfulness and other bad things that happen um, seem to be part of, you know, being in an in systems of violence more generally. So a natural evil might be something like an earthquake that kills people. Moral evil is a person that goes out and kills people. Um, one of the consequences of climate breakdown has been that the lines between moral and natural evil have become really blurred. Um, so we know that this virus is a consequence of our simple relationships to other creatures. Um, lots of people have made the connection that environmental destruction makes viruses jumping from animals more likely. Um, and that also, <clears throat> as climate breakdown continues, we're going to see more and more of these kinds of events. So um, things like SARS, bird flu, um, and coronavirus. Those kinds of um, epidemics and pandemics are going to become more and more frequent. Um, and wrapped up in that, um, that kind of blurring of those lines um, between what we've maybe traditionally considered human spaces and non-human spaces. 
is that you know that's the result that blurring partly of um, our prioritization of our current economic models over everything else um, so I think it's I think it's fair to say that the two are kind of inextricably linked I think this is the moment of um, you know it's a it's a revelatory moment where we um, have a glimpse of our of our both our capacity and our willingness um, for responding to um, global destructive events. One of the things people have said um, about coronavirus, um, you know, has been that it, it's demonstrated that we are capable of, of quite rapid and far-reaching change. Um, our emissions um, globally um, have dropped by 17% since lockdown began. Um, and that, I mean, that's really not very much, given that we need to re reach a kind of net zero state. But it's also worth bearing in mind that really nothing actually has changed. Um, we haven't really changed our, our habit. Um, we haven't really changed the way we consume things. We haven't we haven't really changed our energy systems, um, and our economic system um, has changed slightly, but but not really. I suppose the thing that I found quite difficult to hear um, in people's comparisons between something like this um, pandemic and our wider um, climate and ecological collapse has been, um, you know, people saying things like, oh, nature's healing itself, um, or uh, humans with a virus after all, because of stories like um, cleaner air, um, you know, animals returning to cities, that kind of thing. <clears throat> or, you know, nature is um, nature sent us to our rooms to think about what we've done um, and one of the ways that we can talk maybe with more clarity about the relationship between um, something like a pandemic of this scale and learning how to change our behaviour um, is that we can make distinctions between changes in activity and um, the human beings involved in them so um, people have said things like oh well there's fewer people on the road and so the air is cleaner um well that's not true what it is is a few cars on the road that have made the air cleaner um and that kind of distinction might seem really small but it challenges that that underlying um current in our thought that human life should be seen as at best separate from and at worst the enemy of other creatures that shift in in the way we imagine our relationship to the world around us, I think will create the space for us to do the creative and transformative work we need to do. We can't imagine that it's a binary of choosing between human flourishing and the flourishing of the living world. poet Zina Kazimi. You bring me a doll and tell me to point to where it hurts. I tell you I need an atlas. Bring me a globe. I place my fingertip on the northernmost point and let it spin before me and watch grand mountains and dying oceans and pillaged forests and lifetimes pass before my eyes and wonder how I would rearrange it if the earth was just a small sphere in my hand. I'd fill in the disappearing coral reef with the colors the world is so ready to forget. I'd dip both hands into the oceans of time and carry back home the extinct species to the seas. I'd take the water from the melting ice caps in buckets to the barren deserts, move the unsung clouds from our grey skies to drought-stricken lands and fill the hands of farmers extended in prayer with the rain we so readily complain about. I'd move the bulldozers out of the rainforests so that the trees will not be disturbed in their prostration to their Lord 
and take them instead to the separation wall in the West Bank in Palestine. I'd bring watercolors, the calmest blue, the brightest yellow, to paint over the black blanket of pollution shrouding continents in eternal darkness, hanging over factories where little hands stitch their childhood into the hem of our skirts watching their lives pass by in the reflection in the small, intricate mirror work on our dresses. When I have finished, I'll run my finger along the borders, erase the sketch marks of the colonizers, until the globe is no longer a map, until the word map is erased from history, and the earth returns to just being God's canvas, ready to be adorned by tomorrow's hands. I'm Rowan Williams, the Master of Magdalen College in Cambridge. I first woke up to some of the environmental crisis in my 20s. I was that generation that, uh, I suppose, picked up from Rachel Carson and then from Schumacher. Those early voices, the first uh, swallows of the summer, if you like, who were talking about the devastation that we were creating. And it clicked for me very, very strongly with some of the, the work I was doing as a theologian at the time. I was working on Eastern Christianity, which has a very powerful sense of how the natural world carries the energy of the divine, and how that, that teaches us a kind of uh, veneration for the material environment we're in. It's easy enough to construct a, a story about Western civilization where at some point, everything goes completely wrong. It's never as simple as that. But there is a watershed moment somewhere in the 16th, 17th century where you can actually see somehow the gulf between mind or spirit and body has opened that bit wider. And the sheer resourcefulness of the human mind in exploring the material world draws people into this myth of the active mind and the passive world. Here am I, the maker, the questioner, the inventor. Famously in the image that Francis Bacon uses right at the start of the scientific revolution, I put nature on the rack, I torture nature to make her give up her secrets. It's a very powerful image and a very telling one, not least in its gendered nature. I put the female body of nature there where I can probe and intrude and impose, and that male, dominating, head not heart, mind not body, that's a, a strong myth in Western society, and it dies hard. And you'll still have people, a very distinguished American philosopher, saying, at the end of the day, there is just stuff. And what he means by there is just stuff is actually there is just stuff, plus people like me who write books of philosophy about it. And what we lose in that is the sense of involvement in, interdependence with the world wherein we treat that world out there as something we're not part of. And there is that moment, as I say, in the 16th, 17th century, where the gulf really starts opening up. If you look at the history of science in the 17th century, there's a sort of battle going on under the surface between people who still hold to a more mythological, mystical, participatory, even magical view, whether it's in the poetry of Thomas Traherne or actually in some of the, the philosophers who start the Royal Society. Um, they're not all um, Francis Bacon types who are very conscious of the immense complexity of factors and energies flowing together in the world and are still not quite sure whether they're scientists or magicians. And then you have the people like Francis Bacon for whom, no, it's simple, it's, it's out there, it's dead, just carve it up and label it. The carving up and labeling tends to win over a couple of centuries that follow and then very, very slowly 
It's as if we're steering back towards a deeper sense of interaction and involvement. And so many powerful scientific minds of the last few decades have moved in that direction. People who say, well, let's face it, the world seems to be intelligent in a way we, we've we never really reckoned with. The world exchanges information in a creative way. That's what the material world is. It's bigger than we thought. I think Wendell Berry said something like, there are no unsacred places, there are just sacred places and desecrated places. And we look at what we're doing to the earth and how we're trashing her and trashing ourselves. It's a deep separation from our own inherent sense of purpose and love and our connection to our ancestors and the next generations to come after us. I don't think that change comes driven by the intellect. The intellect has its place in terms of planning things and understanding you know, tactics and things like that. So it's definitely got its role, but ultimately it has to be rooted in the heart. And I think that if you, a word like sacred is something that can speak to people to say that this is something of deep meaning that we're doing together. And I, I, I think it's important that things are rooted very deeply in our bodies. And that's how I feel that word. The Reverend John Swales. So I've been brought up sort of res- respecting uh, creation. You know, I've filled in on online petitions, noticed a bit of Greenpeace stuff and whatever, but really just going about my life, just a general level of awareness. Then about eight months ago, um, a couple of things happened. One, my daughter went on one of the youth strikes, so I just got interested in the the climate stuff. But at the same time, I was preparing a series of talks on the Book of Revelations, a series of sermons. Noticed that in that central part of the Book of Revelation, it talks about uh, famines, it talks about wars. Um, And I just started noticing parallels between what Revelation was talking about and the climate discussion. So during that time of sermon prepping, I got into uh, climate science, reading reports, reading a number of books, listening to podcasts. And I started to see that my general awareness of greenhouse gases uh, and that we may have a problem at some point was, was misguided. It wasn't enough that this is an emergency situation that very likely uh, within my lifetime almost definitely, well, definitely within the lifetime of my kids. We are, unless something drastically changes, we're going to see a world of mass starvation, global migration and societal collapse. And quite frankly, that terrified me, it disturbed me. Um, My peers and colleagues weren't talking about this. And so, well, I must be wrong, so let's do more research. Let's listen to more stuff. Let's see what's out there. Let's get a mainstream view. And actually, the more I researched into it, the more I I realized, yes, there's variety. There's there's different opinions in the scientific community, but the consensus is unless we change things drastically, the future looks tragic. IPCC report, they say we've got another 10 years, really, to sort of really get a grip of decarbonizing radically or that the future is one which will be uh, really incompatible with um, with human existence but the UN Secretary General last year he said we've got two years to do something drastic yes there's differing opinions there but both of them are, are saying this is an emergency situation
so I preached my series on the book of uh, Revelation, um, and I noticed the parallels that in this beastly forces at work today, the unholy trinity of unrestrained capitalism, of consumerism, and individualism. I'm complicit with their power and force, and now my eyes are open. And as I look at the climate science, as we try and predict the future, um, well, all hell in one sense is breaking out. You know, uh, climate change is a threat multiply. We will see more wars. We will see more famines. We will see more disease. We'll see more uh, refugees. All hell is beginning to break out. But what we see now in, a, in the Western world in a... Uh, in a shadowy way, we will quite soon see in Technicolor. Um, and I think what we'll see in the coming uh, coming years is people waking up and grieving for a future which will no longer be. Actually, after... Um, Preaching this series on Revelation, I fell ill uh, with a chest infection, and for about eight weeks, I was really laid up in bed, antibiotics not wor working, staying awake at night, um, crying. I put my kids to bed, and I'd be crying for a future which will no longer be in a place of grief and lament. Um, at that time, st struggling to pray, but that changed and developed into a really prophetic calling of speaking truth to power so i feel that as an uncomfortable calling uncomfortable calling to uh, speak out on these issues with as much clarity as, as as i can i would probably say that grief is still there so an example would be this morning i woke up and about half an hour of getting up you know having a coffee suddenly it, it, it sort of kicks in you know i'm reminded of that normal life nowadays takes place in the context of this catastrophe which is unfolding but grief can be a process and for myself i've been able to move from grief which is almost like denial then paralysis to then being able to move forward with some level of uh, of hope if or to go with brugham and i was in a place of orientation my, my world makes sense uh, i understand the climate science i'm grieving i'm in a place of disorientation I, I don't know who i am i don't know what the world is anymore my worldview is is, is is collapsing and changing around me but now i'm in a place of reorientation so i'm not back at the beginning i have grieved and i grieve and there's there is some despair in that but actually i've moved into another place where i reorientate my my worldview, which means that um, I can actually get out of bed and do things. And part of that would be leaning into lament, but then also leaning into the activism. My hope is that I'm more present in the present. I thought I could dictate and control the future. You know, just in the sense of that's how I imagine things. I can't. In the present, I can I can really be there. So I'm trying to notice more. I'm trying to appreciate the earth better. I'm trying to appreciate things like laughter, uh, joy, just family dynamics, and that life is a life is a gift. I think that's breaking into the present. I can have a glimpse and a foretaste of, of what I, I still hope deep down will one day be of the restoration of all things and all tears wiped away. Grief is different from despair. Despair says nothing will change inside or outside. Grief says things have changed and things will change if they're to change for the better rather than the worse, I've got to understand the grief and go into it and somehow make sense of it. So 
Yes, I grieve for the future in the sense that I think my children and grandchildren will live in a smaller world than I live in. And that's on the very best, the most benign forecast. The not so benign forecast is there'll hardly be a world at all. But at the very best, you know, we'll be living in a world where resources are shrinking, where biodiversity is all the time being eroded, and therefore where anxiety, conflict and rivalry are ratcheting up all the time. I think it's appropriate to grieve that that's how change may work, that's where change will take us. But looking at it with intelligence, with imagination, looking at some of the roots of that in ourselves, that's what turns us away from despair. That's what says change doesn't have to work one way. And if I'm prepared to look in, as well as look around, maybe there are other sorts of change. Recently I came across a wonderful phrase which said that we're homesick for the rest of creation. And that, that puts it very well. That there is a kind of desolation which I suspect a lot of people are feeling at the not quite conscious level, desolation that our company in this world is shrinking. The company of sentient beings, the company of others who share this, this space. And people often now feel this impulse to go and expose themselves to a wilder environment. People talk about rewilding their environment because they're aware that the, the sort of solitary humans only territory we've created is really, really stifling us. When we think of the bad old days in South Africa and um, all those signs saying whites only, occasionally I think there's just a little bit of an analogy with a world in which we're putting up notices saying humans only, as if we really did not want to share our space with the rest of organic life. Now, the effect of that is, of course, to cut into our own flesh, almost literally, to cut into our own readiness to be fed and to be nurtured by the environment we're in, as if we really don't want to be receiving what makes us grow and flourish. So, yes, there's, there's loss, there's bereavement there, and I think that image of homesickness is a very powerful one. That seems to be what people are experiencing. In a strange sort of way, I think the real impact on my faith has been to make me more and more aware of the way in which life and intelligence and interaction permeate everything. It's as if I've been weaned more and more away from the idea that there's a lot of passive stuff out there, there's an active mind in here inside me, to see that mind consciousness moves in everything, that if the world really is in the hand of God and part of the act of God, then God moves in everything. And the big mistake we make is to think that the world is, is just a lump of dead stuff. So in a strange way, I'd say the crisis has woken me up to, to a deeper sense of the vitality of things, the interconnectedness of things. We've discovered in thinking about the environmental crisis more and more vividly how much we depend on each other, how what seems to be a relatively small shift in the biosphere actually upsets all kinds of aspects of the ecology overall. We've discovered that a little adjustment in a local ecology can have consequences across the globe. Um, we look at the, the problems that species of bees have and the effect that has on natural crop production and fertility, how the, the reduction in biodiversity among bee populations is not just something about bees, not, not just a problem about bees, it's a problem about the entire um, biosphere in which the bee operates. It's just one example. And when, when we see that interconnection, we see, I think, more and more vividly how the presence and agency of the creator is just there working, knitting itself together in, in every aspect of where we are and what we are. 
Jesus, it seems to me in the Gospels, is saying two things simultaneously. He's saying, there is a great crisis coming. And for him, it was mostly the, the terrible crisis and tragedy that overtook the Jewish people in the first century. There's a great crisis coming. It's a time of testing. It's a time when everything will be turned inside out. Don't kid yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Things are serious. And the world is running down in some sense. He also says at the same time, stand firm. Be confident that you are loved and you are worthwhile. When you have that confidence that you are reconciled, you are loved, you have the confidence to share that reconciliation and love with others. Start now. Don't leave it till tomorrow. Accept the, the offer of love and reconciliation. Make that offer yourself today. And whether or not the crisis comes or what happens the day after tomorrow, you will be alive now. I think that's a rather, you know, rather pointed um, address to us as we are today. Yes, things are dire, and there's no guarantee that we will resolve the challenges of climate change. It is possible that we've passed the tipping point. But don't be passive. There is a better way of being now. And if you start living like that now, if you change now, well, who knows what becomes possible? In other words, the end of the world is an I don't panic which is a very strange message. <laughs> the end of the world is nigh. You can still live. You can still change. It's still worth being human. I was just thinking about... Um, the IPCC report and three to four degrees this century and then 1.5 degrees and I think for the first time I worked out how old I would be and it's like 35 probably when we hit 1.5 degrees and I'd never quite let my thought process get to the realization that in all likelihood I will see a world of 1.5 degrees and then two degrees and then three. How on earth do I grieve for that? I don't really know. Um, so yes, of course, there are moments that it comes home and you're like, wow, this is so much bigger than I am. And I don't actually know how to comprehend <laughs> that just in my mind. I really don't. And at the same time, I have a real eschatological hope of life comes after death and that love wins and that light is stronger than the darkness. And so I hold on to like a very real sense that when you kind of plant something, plant a seed in the ground and you leave it in darkness and you're like how on earth would that grow and yet it does that that also applies to so many situations around us and I fundamentally do not believe that there is anything that is irredeemable and that is what I hold to um, <laughs> so many people give me hope and inspire me so many people and even it's really little things it's the people from the local environmental group sending me a postcard it's watching um people above the age of 70 underneath a truck in marble arch in the april rebellion chained onto it and it's people who read me a beautiful bit of poetry i'm like wow what an amazing gift of beauty that is and seeing people who also care about this um, and even people who don't care about it everyone models something of life and of goodness and of truth and of beauty and all of those things give me hope and they all inspire me in different ways Troubling times are ahead Never could be what they said Won't be the same anyways Just as it was our land And it, it breaks my heart Cause there's still love here And it breaks apart The life we share 
and it speaks of love that you don't want me to go. But I said it before, I want to live happily, but that doesn't seem quite right anymore. When you ask what this is for I want to live for my cause Ready to lay down my nights and my days for this war And it, it breaks my heart that there's still love here And it breaks apart the life we share And it speaks of love that you don't want me to go But I said it before, I want to live happily But that doesn't seem quite right anymore Penitence can't stall the time We already walk a fine line I'd be ashamed to remain Just to change your mind And God knows that it breaks my heart That there's still love here And it breaks apart the life we share And it speaks of love That you don't want me to go but I said it before, I want to leave happily, but that doesn't seem quite right anymore. I want to leave happily, but that doesn't seem quite right anymore. What is living? The broad hall found between narrow walls. What is acknowledging? Finding the one root under the branches tangle. What is believing? Watching at home till the time arrives for welcome. What is forgiving? Pushing your way through thorns to stand alongside your old enemy. What is singing? The ancient gifted breath drawn in creating. What is labour but making songs from the wood and the wheat? What is it to govern kingdoms? A skill still crawling on all fours. And arming kingdoms? A knife placed in a baby's fist. What is it to be a people? A gift lodged in the heart's deep folds. What is love of country? Keeping house among a cloud of witnesses. What is the world to the wealthy and strong? A wheel that turns and turns. What is the world to Earth's little ones? A cradle, rocking and rocking. For me personally, there was no revelation in relation to climate change. At no moment did I suddenly think, I wake up one day and think, you know, this, this is an issue I've got to spend the rest of my life working on. And I should hasten to add that I really, you know, I really, in some respects, wish I'd never left my, my earlier careers. And I, was, I was, used to work in the Merchant Navy. I spent my earlier life um, training as an engineer to work on ships, traveling around the world carrying cargo. Um, it started to, started to be interested in issues of climate change. And then I, so I went to, back to university to study issues of climate change. And with various small breaks in between, I've be, basically been working on it since the 1990s. But at no point did I think, 
um, did I wake up to think this is the most important issue? It was a gradual evolution, and that evolution came across, I think, because it became increasingly evident that we were choosing to fail. So who's the we? I mean, the high-emitting people in our world that are, have the privilege of being able to understand these issues. So I think there's sometimes deliberate ignorance, sometimes or willful ignorance, if you like, and others that then will deliberately massage our own assumptions and storylines to delude both ourselves and other people about, about our responsibility, the high emitter's responsibility, um, and about the fact is that we have the agency to act but choose not to. Our emissions in 2018 were about 67% higher of carbon dioxide than they were in 1990. And even a country like the UK has made almost no shift in its emissions since 1990. And other countries, progressive countries like Sweden, France and Denmark, have seen no reduction in emissions since 1990. 50% of global emissions come from 10% of the world's population. 70% of the emissions come from just 20% of the population. And in highly unequal countries like the UK, or in the US for instance, then those, those breakdowns are not that dissimilar. So it is not normal people driving occasionally in, a, in an older car, living in a terraced house or living in rented accommodation. These are not the people who are, are really the main causes of climate change in a country like the UK. They are the professors, the barristers, the, you know, the well-paid teachers. The, you know, there's a se more senior people on the, on the moderate to high and the very high incomes in the UK and broadly the higher income, the higher the emissions by and large. That These are the people responsible for the lion's share of emissions even in the UK. And yet we still describe futures whereby we almost look, look at everyone as if they're all the same. And at the moment, we are still discussing, and so are most academics, about bolting climate change onto business as usual. This is a fundamental change to business as usual because we have chosen to fail on reducing our emissions for 30 years. What we have to address at the moment, of course, is not just one clearly defined, clearly focused enemy. It's a system. It's a complicated spider's web of practices and assumptions um, and vested interests extending from right from the top end, the fossil fuel industry, through to everything that the fossil fuel industry fuels, um, investment policies that go with that, right through to food miles in the supermarket. Yeah, you, you, where do you start with all that? That's, that's one of the difficulties. And that's why whatever options the individual might make about adjusting, as I've said, making those small changes that can be made, there are things that only coordinated action from higher up can really make a difference to. So pressure on governments, pressure on governments to cooperate becomes enormously important. So yes, speaking to power is a key element. Well, they have the biggest responsibility because also the Bible says that he who has more respons has more has more responsibility, and they have been the ones who have taken have abused our our resources and the people and everything to their advantage. So now is the turn to stop doing that and start trying uh, changing that. Because if they don't change, every little effort that we do here is important, but it, it won't be the same. So it's their responsibility to, to stop looking at their pockets and start looking at the people. Power is what it is, partly because it practices being deaf. So sometimes the volume has to be turned up. In the last year or so, the emergence of Extinction Rebellion, the development of the school strikes and so on. This seems to be a matter of turning up the volume. Non-violent civil disobedience. What you might call the theatre of non-violent protest. Just as a witness to the depth of conviction, the depth of concern. That has already clearly had an impact.
people sometimes ask about the the, not the legitimacy, the, the morality, if you like, of defying the law or resisting the law, or breaking the law. And what's important then is to ask, well, what, what is the law for? Law is to conserve the stability and security of a society. We have a legal system, we have police, we have courts, so that people will feel that they have somewhere to go if they're damaged, hurt, robbed, offended, etc. What if you live in a world where the very possibility of stability and security is being undermined by a lot of the practices we take for granted in our economy? Then you have, in a way, to drive back towards the first principles of law and say, yes, okay, I am defying or transgressing this particular regulation for the sake of law itself, that is, for the sake of a society which has security, stability, justice, etc. Um, I accept the consequences. If I break the law, I go to jail. Fine. But I'm, if you like, calling the law to account in terms of its own first principles. In Leeds, set up um, with, uh, with, a, with a few like-minded people, set up Christian cl Climate Action Group in Leeds, and then a few of us decide to go down to uh, the October Rebellion. And it has to be one of the most strange, beautiful, sad, uh, holy experiences which I have had. At one point, I was with a, uh, we had a bit of a choir formed. There was protesters, grandparents locked on to each other and locked onto the ground, refusing to move because the um, and they're going to be arrested. But the police are waiting for the uh, bolt cutters and whatever to to arrive. So this, you know, I found myself walking the streets of London, um, weeping, crying, like leading morning prayer by a hearse where people have locked themselves on to the hearse and you're there praying for people and jo joining with the protesters and finding my liturgy changing with the context. This, this needs to change the language that we use. I found myself doing reaffirming people's baptisms in Trafalgar Square, uh, becoming more aware than ever that the buildings and the architecture around are representative of, of, of power and industry and uh, uh, the powerful. And instead of saying to people, do you turn from sin? Would I change that, make it more specific to the context. Do you, do you turn from unrestrained capitalism, consumerism and individualism? And then the people who had reaffirmed the baptism would head off into the city of London to be arrested. <laughs> Very strange uh, situation to find myself uh, find myself in. What's interesting with civil disobedience, I often think people like it in the past and admire it in the past and go, oh, the wonderful suffragettes or Martin Luther King or Gandhi, you know. Uh, and then when you do it today, it's problematic and annoying. <laughs> and actually, we have a history of civil disobedience in this country that you know, people often again point to the suffragettes, but since then, you know, there's been a, they were mass trespassers and that's why we have the right to roam and, uh, you know, people like the Ramblers Association came out of mass trespass. We had people pulling up GM crops and get involved in civil disobedience, including Prince Charles. So we have a, a good tradition of it and it's about doing what's right. Duty is to honour sacred law and the, the law of love and civil disobedience is a manifestation of that and I also see it as very initiatory because we're stuck in a system that wants us to stay quiet and wants us to keep our heads down and keep consuming it's very narcissistic it's very self-indulgent and there's something about saying I do not stand by this system and when you commit an act of civil disobedience, it's a breaking of your relationship with something. For, for, it's a Rubicon to cross. And when people do it, they have an inner transformation very often. It has an element of trickster in it as well. It has an element of mischief in it potentially, but certainly an element of 
of sacred service. So I was really amazed getting into the environmental movement, holding a space which is sort of inherently confrontational because you're saying, I don't like the status quo and I want to be counted as being anti that. And as someone who I really dislike conflict, I cannot tell you how much I dislike it. I find that an incredibly difficult space to hold, but also a really powerful one. And I think there's something about stepping outside of the ordinary into something that feels extraordinary that opens your eyes to other dimensions of the extraordinary as well. And so when I'm standing in a place that I can sometimes feel a little bit nervous about, I'm also most open to God And I find it an amazing place to pray and also an amazing place to have fellowship with other people because my experience of the environmental movement is a lot of people are wrestling with and acknowledging their own brokenness and that of um, that they see in the world and um, the people around them. And they're working out, how do I go forward with this? Oh, I think kind of love, hope, sacrifice, all of these different ideas. They're all very much open questions that people have and there's a lot of diverging opinions about where they're moving towards as well. But it's a space that's very open to, I guess, the cracks and brokenness and vulnerability. And it's a really amazing place for connection with other people and to experience church in a different sense of that word. In my job here in Leeds, I work closely with the police. I'm a friend of the police uh, receive grants from the police for the work I do. In the context of the October rebellion I was struck by the both the humanness of the police but also struck by that how they are a tool of the state. So while I was there a section 14 was declared for the whole of London which meant it was illegal for myself to gather with a couple of others under the name of Extinction Rebellion, even if you weren't committing an offence except for the Section 14 being in place. Um, That's gross misuse of uh, a power. So in one sense, the police aren't friends. They are there to do their job. Um, At the same time, every police officer is, uh, is made in the image of God. If I get to know each police officer individually, I'm getting to know something of more of what God is like. This is a situation where there's maybe 30 people all locked on, to, you know, locked onto baths, locked onto structures. Um, and I was weeping, weeping because um, it was beautiful. The police were there dragging people away and the people sat on the ground were singing songs of peace. And I'm upset because I'm seeing, you know, grandmothers and scientists and professors and teachers and builders being, being dragged away by the police. And the police officer came up to me and said, uh, are you all right then? I said, no, not really. And um, she said, why is that? I said, well, I've got some questions. She goes, what are those? I said, I looked at her and tried to catch her eye. And I said, at what point, at what point as a police officer does your conscience not allow you to do what you've been ordered to do. And she leaned forward and she said to me, you need to know I've handed in my notice. I've only got two weeks left and I've already been in touch with XR to be one of their police liaison officers. I went there with the intention of getting arrested. Just before I went, my, my nana, my grandmother died and I had, a, I had a funeral, which I had just a couple of, uh, couple of days ago, which I was leading. And I decided not to add extra u- upset. So I was in a strange place where I went there with the intention of getting arrested, but then was actually trying to avoid arrest, which was more difficult than I thought. I was getting stopped. Um, I'd have a vicar collar on, walking around London with a retired friend. Police officer would come up and say, are you a protester? I'd say yes. And he'd say, the only place you can go to now is Trafalgar Square. And I would say, um, I'm not going to commit an offence. I'm not going to sit in the road. I just want to go to uh, Westminster Abbey and pray. And I was told very clearly, the only place you can go to now, you have no permission to go anywhere else. It took everything within me not to sit on the floor there and then and get get, get arrested. 
in this country we have in my view a kind of pretense of a democracy and any ways that we break the law are a way of saying that the that this this land you know law is not being used in a healthy way in this land and therefore i need to break the law to make myself be heard people don't pay attention when you stand on the sidelines holding a banner unfortunately they, they can have some value writing to your mp signing a petition going on a march they can help raise awareness of something but frankly we've been doing that for 30 years and carbon dioxide emissions have gone up 60 percent it hasn't worked that and i think people have to understand that civil disobedience has got a long history and there's a lot of evidence that that is the thing that makes the change it's a confrontation stage and it's done respectfully and with dignity and with beauty and with fun and with compassion, then it makes sense. The first thing is organization, because uh, when they start working together, then they find the common goals that they have as a community. When they start uh, identifying needs and prioritizing needs and making plans together, then they are encouraged and continue uh, working. Every community has to have a community plan, taking into account needs both from men and women and from youth, from children. So everything is in included in that, in that plan. And we say, don't make a big plan that you won't be able to fulfill. Do small things. And then we uh, say, here are the laws, and we teach them some laws about uh, community participation, about uh, natural resources, about water, so they can go and speak to the, their local, their municipal uh, uh, authorities and, and say, here is our plan, here are our needs, what uh, is in your budget for us? And so they may be road repairs, electricity, water, schools, anything. And, uh, and some of our community leaders now have become council members. And, and so that gives them more strength. There are huge political structural issues that we have to address. But I don't see the, the, the division, the di often the, the false dichotomy, in my view, between the individual and the structure, the state, the policy realm. These, they, are, they are two sides of the same coin. We work as a partnership. It's a messy partnership between bottom up and top down. They're not separate things. So policymakers may very occasionally come up with wonderful ideas themselves, but almost always they're influenced by other things they have seen around them. And often those things have emerged from some sort of grassroots change. And we don't know where they play out. It, it isn't an emergence system, but those things generally will somewhere will play out in other people around us, in our institutions. That may play out then in terms of local councils, and that may play out in terms of changing an agenda or a dialogue that the policymakers at a national level, or indeed at an international level, may start to, to have. There are three elements to it, as I see, for us. The first thing, we need to identify the large carbon footprint components in our own lives. It's not too challenging if you sit down to think, well, where do my main carbon emissions come from? It's basically, where do we use most of our energy? Actually, the emissions savings that we get if we try to make those changes, which we need to do, are not that important. But what is important is it gives us the credibility to talk about that with our friends, our families, at our work and so forth. So there's really clear psychological evidence to say that, that if you want to try to have debates and arguments, then actually your credibility is improved if you are trying to do these things yourself. And particularly then if you can talk about how difficult it is or how easy you found it. So those discussions and dialogues are facilitated by us trying to do these things. But the emissions themselves, let's be clear, are, are much less important than the idea it opens up the scope for localised dialogue. That localised dialogue then plays out within our universities, within our schools, within our hospitals, within the, wherever we happen to work, in our sports clubs, with our friends, down the pub, all of those things. We start a new dialogue. But we also need to engage directly with our companies, um, with the institutions that we're more directly involved with, with our local councils. I think about what solutions we can come up with if people are putting forward things that are completely counter to responding to climate change, then emphasise those things. Use our local media, use the local radio, write letters, write emails, engage via social media. There are lots of ways that we can have our, our say and our influence. We may not always be right. We think our ideas are good. We have to listen to other people's ideas. So listening, not just hearing what other people are saying, and then evolving our own ideas. But I think there's a role beyond that as well to, to engage at the national level. 
policymakers, particularly most of the European countries, the democratic process is still incredibly rich and really open to many people to have engagement with. I know we criticise it all the time, but I think we, we are far too cynical about our political processes. Write to our MPs, go to the surgeries, critique what they say when the things don't fit, but also be very supportive when they are making difficult policy decisions that are broadly in line with our commitments. It's of driving a, a much stronger agenda across all of these tiers from our, from our immediate local vicinity to our, to our sort of towns and villages and communities to the national level. And we as citizens, I think, can engage across all of those. So we need to open up space for this dialogue as wide as we can. It must, it, we must make sure we get much greater cultural buy-in here. Sometimes these other communities will have different cultural framings, different ways to look at the issues, different sets of insights that could be really revealing to, to the rest of us as well. So we need to, that wider portfolio of, of thinking about these issues. And we need to develop new narratives, not just a narrative about a progressive future, but multiple narratives about a progressive, low-carbon, equitable future. We need to reconsider what do we mean by value? What do we mean by rewarding success? Um, we need to have a better concept of, of time. So rather than just be thinking about the short term, think about the longer term, about our children and our children's children and our children's children's children and about other species as well, the non-human world or the more than human world, not non-human, but the more than human world. I think one of the problems we have had is we have taken post-enlightenment a very reductionist view of the world and it's been phenomenally successful. Let's not pretend otherwise. Reductionism, post-enlightenment, along with the fossil fuels, have provided us with lots of really wonderful things in our society. But what we have been really poor at doing is understanding the system implications of that sort of reductionism and of our level of sort of extractive, extraction from society, our, our abstraction from it in some respects, but our also extraction from it in terms of materials. And I think we have been very poor at that and are really struggling still to understand system implications, whilst we're excellent at looking at more and more detail of a smaller and smaller part of the system. We seem to be almost like genetically you know, um, unable to be able to stand back and look at the bigger system implications. But I think we have to start doing that. And sometimes maybe other cultures have been better at doing that than the, sort of a, than, than the dominant sort of Western culture that we're seeing, uh, certainly around us in, in the Northern Hemisphere and influencing other parts of the world, perhaps uh, unduly influencing other parts of the world. Ultimately, this is going to be a, a, you know, it is going to be a messy partnership on every single level between the seven and a half billion people living on this planet, between us and other species as well, between technologies and politics and, and the social sciences and the humanities. There are no silver bullets to this problem. There are no very clear pathways and probably won't be a single clear pathway. It's going to be an iterative learning process, but we can't sit on our laurels anymore we have to start to respond immediately we should have responded yesterday and because we didn't it's much more profound sorts of rates of change that we require today um, but we need a we need a much wider constituency of, of voices to be heard if we are going to respond in any reasonable reasoned fashion to the challenge that we have brought upon ourselves Well, we believe that this is this is Earth is not ours. It was created by God, and uh, and Jesus came here to Earth, I believe, and He lived among us. He felt what we felt, what humankind felt, and He saw the needs, and He saw. The, uh, I like the passage. When he fell, a, a multitude, uh, 5,000 men, women, and children, he could have made a miracle, you know, out of nothing and brought the bread and fed the people. But he, he said, uh, do you have something? You feed them. And they, you know, we don't have anything. So he said, anything, nothing? Well, here is a child with five loaves of bread and two fish. In the hands of Jesus that multiplied. We are not asked to be just, you know, waiting that everything comes from heaven. We have to do our share. 
we have to find that resources, look around in a collective way. And uh, he then told the disciples, tell the people to sit down on the green grass. So you can use the earth, you can use the grass, you can use whatever is in your hand, but collectively it will be extended to everyone. And everyone was fed, that's what it says. Uh, so I, I believe that as Jesus came to teach, to preach, and to heal, we are also uh, commanded because he also said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. So it's the same mission that Jesus came to uh, do on earth that is our mission, to care for everyone else and, of course, to care for creation as well. This recognition of our interconnection with things is, I suppose, what shows itself in a greater openness simply to understanding how it works, the kind of science that really does explore intelligent exchange in the world. It shows itself, above all, I would say, in a sort of sympathetic patience with the processes of nature. We don't try to get shortcuts and quick fixes out of the natural world. It's not that we just leave it alone, but our involvement with it becomes something that is prepared to spend a bit longer feeling of the grain of things, not making dramatic, overwhelming interventions. So the good gardener listens to the soil and the season and the nature of the plant. The good gardener doesn't say, my main job is to get this garden full of the same flowers 12 months through. The good gardener says, the interventions I make, the action I take, will have to be somehow you know, in and around how things actually grow. So too much intervention, too much technological triumphalism about how we engage with the world is part of our problem. Scaling that back a bit, learning a bit about walking at the pace of the world around us, I think, is how it shows itself. And that's why I'd say things like, <laughs> said sometimes in the past, gardening and cooking are good for us. They show us what can't be hurried. And maybe that unhurried relation is the way we show that we've got the point. So we say that tell the truth, you know, that's our request and that has to be for ourselves as well. And so telling the truth is about speaking to your friends and family and neighbours about this crisis in an honest way and about the rebellion in an honest way. We don't know it's going to succeed and we don't know what can be saved. And if we just make it sound like, oh yeah, if we just work really hard and we rebel and then we're going to turn this thing around and everything's going to be okay, it just doesn't feel honest. I suppose the question is, how bad could it be? There are so much heating locked in to the system already, tipping points are already being breached, the ice is melting. And what would it look like if we really took this emergency seriously in the next year or so? And, and we went into, it's for want of a better analogy, a wartime approach, a wartime economy. And I don't mean that we're in war with anything, but that spirit of like, actually we're in a crisis and we've got to all pull together and do something here. On the one hand, we have to try. Ultimately, it comes back to this point of what's the right thing to do. Is the right thing just to roll over and give up? in despair. Well, despair is not a fun place to be, actually. So I always say, look into the abyss. And it is an abyss. Really look into it. Don't shy away from looking into it. Because we're a death phobic culture. And when you face your own death, and you face death of, and the problems that your children are going to face, and the, love, the ones that you love, and life, life on earth face, and it's hard, but you can face it. You have the inner strength to do it, especially if you have faith. And face it, feel it, and then decide what you're going to do about it.
put your hands in the soil, feel the groan and feel the joy, or sit with the hurt, stare into the dirt, occupy the bandstands, gather lost citizens, climb down your pyramids, relinquish your privilege, welcome strangers to your table, as though they were angels, make space for the spent, Feel the lament, break your vows to the powers, plant trees and grow flowers, share the resources, free all the horses. All citizens, put your hands in the soil and feel the growth. Feel the joy and be still and be still. Down by the riverside, who's not afraid to die? Emerge from the waves, broke loose from the powers of the age. Live now, citizens, of what's left of the age to come. Behold the Messiah dying For the lands we are crucifying Break bread and take drink All feel and think Shed tears every day For everything we throw away Mourn for your families Mourn for your enemies Sing to the stars Console thy grieving heart Citizens, put your hands in the soil and feel the growth. Can you feel the joy and be still and be still? Clap your hands to your mouth, let your pride go south, put your hand on your head, make terms with the dead, put your hands on your face, too late to learn from my mistakes, put your hand on your heart, can we stop what we start? Sisters to the leverage, brothers to the edges, youth to the floor. This bleak future is yours All ye of noble bone Join the scum of the earth Gather round the powerless There's the power that can save us All citizens Put your hands in the soil And feel the growth Feel the joy and be still 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 and be still.